We gather this morning on the first Sunday of the 46th Presidency of the United States. We find ourselves at the dawning of a new era, and just as significantly, we find ourselves at the end of another. Growing up in the Catholic Church, we used to sing one of my favorite hymns in the words of Dan Schute, let us build the city of God. May our tears be turned into dancing. For the Lord, our light and our life, has turned the night into day. This is an occasion for celebration. In normal times, we might be gathered downtown waving flags, sharing hugs, honking car horns, singing songs. And of course, it's just not safe to do that yet. But this occasion is no less significant, even in this strange quote-unquote new normal of coronavirus. In fact, we really should be celebrating. We should be celebrating and rejoicing in the very fact that we now have an administration who will listen to our doctors, epidemiologists, and biologists as they offer the guidance of science to bring an end to this pandemic once and for all. We welcome this nation's very first woman vice president, first woman of color vice president, first Southeast Asian vice president. We welcome an openly gay secretary of transportation and an openly trans secretary of health. This is a monumental moment in the history of the United States. In the words of Ma Muse, we shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. It cannot be overstated how powerful it is to see such a diverse group of professionals representing so many marginalized groups assembled to inform the running of this country. We have so much work yet to do to repair the damage done to this country and to so many lives by the last four years. We remain painfully aware of the unprecedented polarization of our population and the looming threat of extremist violence, of the hatred held by white supremacists who enjoyed four years of an open acknowledgement and validation from a leader who spoke to folks of their ideology as faithful servants telling them to quote, stand back and stand by, who will no longer be called patriots for their violence by the President of the United States. And yet, celebration can be an act of rebellion. The Stonewall Riots of June 1969 are commemorated today by gay pride celebrations around the world. San Francisco Supervisor Harvey Milk, the first openly gay person elected to office in the United States, left a tape recording to be played in anticipation of his assassination, in which he said the following. I'd like to pause and acknowledge that this passage does contain a poignant and evocative description of gun violence, and that may be disturbing to some people. He said, I cannot prevent some people from feeling angry and frustrated and mad in response to my death, but I hope they will take the frustration and madness and instead of demonstrating or anything of that type, I would hope that they would take the power and I would hope that five, 10, 100, a thousand would rise. I would like to see every gay lawyer, every gay architect come out, stand up and let the world know. That would do more to end prejudice overnight than anyone could imagine. I urge them to do that, urge them to come out. Only that way will we start to achieve our rights. All I ask is for the movement to continue. And if a bullet should enter my brain, let that bullet destroy every closet door. Gay pride is on its surface a celebration, but it's also an act of defiance. In June, 2016, Omar Matane killed 49 people at the LGBT Pulse nightclub in Orlando, right in the middle of Pride Month. A wave of fear and mourning and heartbreak and a foreboding sense of danger swept the queer community globally. And yet, that very next week, our own Denver Pride was held right on schedule 
with a turnout no less than any June. Some of you present this morning marched in that very parade. My home congregation, Columbine, UU, and Littleton, even began a new tradition that day. We call worship in the streets, closing our doors on Sunday morning with a message that the work of Unitarian Universalism in the wake of homophobic violence was not going to happen in the pews of a church building. Celebration can be an act of defiance. In the words of admittedly problematic revolutionary Emma Goldman, popularized by the movie V for Vendetta, a revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. In this challenging and uncertain time, take the time to center hope and joy. Take the time to center hope and joy. I just want to say that over and over and over. This is a sermon that I haven't gotten to preach in four years. Take the time to center joy and hope. Celebrate. And also, call to mind everything that we have witnessed over the past four years and hold the gravity of all that has happened. It's going to take more than a few policy changes to mitigate the harm done by the previous administration. We can reform our immigration policy once and for all, but we cannot bring back those who were torn away from their lives lost by mass deportation. Nor can we give them back the years of their lives that were lost in that process. And moreover, bear in mind that despite all of the xenophobic rhetoric from Donald Trump about immigrants, his administration failed in its first three years to match even half the number of deportations carried out in the first three years of the Obama administration with then Vice President Joe Biden. The drastic reduction in deportations is due in no small part to the growing new sanctuary movement of which First Unitarian is a vital part. Nevertheless, let this serve as a sobering reminder that white supremacy Systemic inequality and injustice did not begin with Trump. It's been said that Donald Trump was not the cause of our problems, but the symptom. We still have much work to do to create a world of justice, equity, and compassion in accordance with our second principle. As we celebrate the close of a very disturbing chapter of American history, it is crucial that we continue to see the last four years for what they were, a moment of clarity, a wake-up call. The shamelessness with which our president spoke of hatred forced us to see reality which he was not responsible for. This last year in particular has been characterized by radical and unprecedented action in support of human compassion in response to the political climate with a summer of protests for Black Lives Matter following the killing of George Floyd. And yet, when we went down to those protests, when we marched in the street, when we sang the songs and chanted the chants, we were called upon to speak also the names of Breonna Taylor and Elijah McClain, whose deaths had previously gone unnoticed, unrecognized, unresponded to. In fact, the modern movement for black lives, as we remember, dates to the tragic murder of Michael Brown in August of 2014. It was long, long before Trump was even involved in politics. And of course, we know that the wanton disregard for the inherent worth and dignity of human lives that reside in black bodies goes back for centuries. So as we celebrate this monumental moment in history, I'd like to call to mind again that Jesuit hymn, let us build the city of God. Let us build the city of God. May our tears be turned into dancing. For the Lord, our light and our love has turned the night into day. We are called as Unitarian Universalists to lay the foundations for a new city in this life and on this earth. We do not wait for the coming of rewards after death, but we take up the call to create the most sacred and most beautiful reflection of the divine each and every day. 
This is not an end, but a milestone on the never-ending path towards righteousness. And it's a significant one. California is now represented by their first Latin senator, Georgia by their first black senator. It's a great injustice that these firsts have taken so long to arrive. Almost 40% of the state of California is Latin and 32% of Georgia is black. So today we celebrate first steps towards amplifying the voices of these populations who make up such a vital part of our society. And we also recognize that simply amplifying voices is not in and of itself a valuable end. In order to truly move our society towards justice, we must also listen and act. In our own microcosm of Unitarian Universalism, we too are seeing historic change with the release of the Commission on Institutional Changes report widening the circle of concern, the movement to adopt the Eighth Principle, which calls us to actively engage in anti-oppression and anti-racism work, and a denomination-wide conversation about dismantling white supremacy in our institutions and our society, we too have turned the spotlight on the voices of the marginalized, and we too must be prepared to listen. I was blessed last fall to participate, along with your own Jen Simon, in the founding of a new Unitarian Universalist community of Black, Indigenous, and people of color called The Mountaintop. In that space, I witnessed the pain of so many individuals who feel there is no space for them to be their authentic selves within Unitarian Universalism. Our faith calls us to honor the interdependent web of all life. And as such, we must acknowledge the impact that centuries of white supremacy and systemic oppression within our own communities has had and continues to have on our own people. In the words of Bernice Johnson Reagan, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. And yet, we have never before been better poised to do this work. In a very literal sense, all our doors are already closed due to the circumstances of the pandemic. We have already vacated our pews in preparation to worship in the street. But may we start that sacred work in this time of celebration with dancing in the street. Get up and dance or sit or lie, but engage with your body and your soul and your heart and your mind in the celebration of this moment. We commemorate this milestone and imbue it with value. The word worship comes from Old English vert skippen, which means worth shaping, the creation of value. When we take time from our lives, from our pocketbooks, from our minds, and we dedicate our life, a little section of our life to something, we give it value. We get up on a Sunday morning and we get on Zoom and we dial in because First Unitarian is still our church. It's still our community. We give that worth. And so too is dancing in the streets a form of worship, celebration. We need this moment and we need to imbue it with value. This week in which we see these faces that we have never seen before in places of power is huge. To see a woman of Indian descent presiding as Vice President of the United States, that needs to be given worth. We need to dance. We need to dance. Because a revolution without dancing is a revolution not worth having. Blessed be.